Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are delighted to, to welcome you all for this second workshop dedicated to digital ethnographies. In the series of workshops entitled Delineating the Digital, hosted by Cox's Two Time Network. Um, just a brief introduction to the workshop. Um, so, digital ethnography uh, has its origin in traditional ethnography, and it emphasizes the experiences of day to day realities taking place uh, in digitally connected spaces and uh, the significance and challenges of narrating human stories through the online sphere. This digital ethnography is a digital transformation of in-person ethnography, materializing the power of computational methods to help researchers generate contextual insights into human needs, journeys, and experiences remotely. So as an architect urban planner, I had relied heavily on traditional ethnography because my work was related uh, to the local communities and it was important that I conduct surveys with them. But it was during 2020, uh, during the time of the pandemic that I found myself stuck like many of us. And then at that time, I had no choice but to uh, carry out a desk-based study for my research project. It was also the time that I got very much interested in exploring the field of digital methodologies and digital ethnography was one of those uh, research methods that I adopted to for my work. And later on, I got very much interested in exploring more. And I think the idea to conduct these workshops has stemmed from that personal interest. But also at the same time, we at Caucasus, we believe that uh, with the advancement uh, in technology and social media, it is very important that we learn uh, these different methodologies to bring uh, this digital paradigm to the forefront. And uh, so in today's workshop, we are going to uh, discuss the broad scope of uh, digital methodologies uh, to be like focused more on ethnography, digital ethnography. And our wonderful speaker is going to walk us through uh, how to, you know, sort of conduct digital ethnography and also will provide us with an opportunity to discuss more about its application in our own projects. Over to Norman. Um, thank you very much, Taba, and um, hi everyone. Uh, in advance, sorry for my internet, it might be very slow. Um, I will be very briefly talk about our network, which we've been mm. founded it in January 2021. Okay. So we are quite young. Um, so we are quite young uh, network. Uh, focusing on the Caucasus region and beyond adjacent regions such as Iran, Turkey. We're looking at the, we are focusing on the field of history, art history, anthropology, archaeology, medieval studies. And the network is very much inclusive and, uh, and encouraging environment, all welcome. So if you have, if you want to join our network, for, please feel free to e uh, reach out to us and I will put our email in the chat box uh, and we have we want to expand uh, expand uh, our voluntary team so please welcome um, uh, to be part of our amazing team uh, we, we are in our committee we have like lovely people doing amazing uh, uh, um, focusing on the Caucasus region and uh, yeah so thank you very much and I will pass to uh, Saba. Thank you very much. Uh, Ruben, uh, yes. well, <laughs> Sorry. So it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our uh, presenter. Uh, so our workshop facilitator, Gabriele, is technically a sociologist and holds a PhD from Hong Kong Polytechnical University and was a postdoctoral fellow at the Institute of Ethnology Academia Sinica in Taipei. Gabriele is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Bergen, where he is part of the ERC-funded project Machine Vision in Everyday Life. His research work grounded on ethnographic in engagement across multiple sites, focuses on digital media practices, social technical 
entanglements and vernacular creativity in the Chinese speaking world. He's also interested in experimental music, internet art and collaborative intersections between anthropology and art practice. Gabriele, please share your screen and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Perfect. Yes, can you see the slide? Good. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, if there's any problem with the um, with my uh, connection, let me know and I can stop. So uh, thanks for the invitation. Uh, always happy to talk about methodology, even uh, as I was saying um, in a field or context that I'm not very much familiar with, but I hope uh, this talk will be useful. Um, so I wanted to pitch uh, this uh, workshop as a, an invitation. Um, since I've seen that you had uh, workshops on very different kinds of methodologies, uh, and I assume not everyone is familiar with digital ethnography. So this is a sort of yeah, invitation in this broad field of uh, research methods. Here, just put some of the books uh, that have been written about this. Um, there is countless volumes about digital ethnography. So we're gonna just, just overview a little bit of what, what has been done. Um, so uh, the, this talk should be around 30 minutes and I wanna um, just briefly uh, sketch what I'm going to do. I'm gonna introduce you to what digital ethnography is, um, go through some basic concepts of ethnography in general, um, then talk about how it turned towards the digital and then just give you some ideas about how to do it, um, how to, yes, how to do digital ethnography. And then I'm gonna conclude and recap. Um, and the main question that I want to answer are, so what, what is digital ethnography, where it comes from, uh, why it is useful, and uh, how to use it. And then, because since it is a workshop, I thought the actual, the, for me, the most important part is the Q&A when you know, I, I can hear from you and any questions you might have on the topic. Um, so if you have longer questions or reflections, just you know, note them down for the Q&A. If you have short, shorter questions or things that are not clear, you want me to clarify, just interrupt me, it's fine. Um, we're on Zoom anyway, so it's useful to do. Um, <clears throat> so since this is a workshop, uh, I, I would encourage you to, you know, to take the opportunity to work shopping things together. So just some ideas that I saw are useful in other, other times I've given this talk is to uh, keep your research project or projects in mind and jot down things that I say that might be useful or interesting for you, like very egoistically. And, um, you know, if you think, oh, this could work for my project, or this would not work, uh, you know, take a note um, and also think about the context. So I, I will be talking mostly about China, but if there's anything that resonates with the you know, Caucasus region or, or is dissonant with your experience there, that's also useful to discuss later. So these are four main things that you can keep in mind as we go. So <clears throat> what is digital ethnography? Uh, big question. Um, so I think it's useful to just think about the, the term. Digital is one of those extremely broad terms that mean anything. Uh, it can be digital media, digital society, digital life, digital future, all these buzzwords that, that um, we have around us. Uh, and it, this term is combined with ethnography, which is a very specialized term coming from uh, social and human sciences um, to define a participatory qualitative research method. So what we have uh, as digital ethnography is a toolbox, as many methodologies are, of participatory qualitative methods that are uh, useful <clears throat> to conduct research on, through, and about digital media. And we will come back to this definition in a bit. Um, <clears throat> so for the ones who might not be that familiar with ethnography in general, uh, ethnography is a, you know, is a longstandingly used methodology in, in human and social sciences that in turn comes from this combination of ethno and graphy. And ethno <clears throat> was in the beginning used to define an ethnic group or ethnic other. So a sort of ethnicity based research or also known as ethnology, uh, or more generally a people, a group of people 
But today this is used uh, mostly to actually refer to any group of actors in, in any social context. And uh, <clears throat> the other part, graphy, uh, similar to photography, bi biography, topography. So things that are, it's, it's something that is meant to produce a, a written result to um, write something. It does not need to be text, it can be, a, it can be an ethnographic movie, uh, any kind of output. Um, but in general, the combination of this using qualitative research to study people or other actors in a social setting through writing or some sort of writing. So this is what ethnography means today. Um, but it, it was very different uh, 100 years ago, of course. Um, so as you probably know, uh, ethnography has been developed in anthropology uh, as its probably chief uh, method of study. And um, I put some, a couple of quotes from uh, anthropologists here to give you a sense of what the traditional understanding of ethnography was. So it was <clears throat> uh, this idea of, these are from Tim Ingold, I think. Uh, the, the main idea behind ethnography is that you meet people, you talk to them, you ask them questions, you listen to their stories, watch what they do, uh, because this is what people do when they meet one another. It's, it's a very basic um, way of interacting with one another. And <clears throat> driving home the, the idea that it's about writing, Ingle says, <clears throat> after you do all of this, uh, to not forget, you write it all down in field notes as soon as the opportunity arises. So the main two practices are this of yeah, interaction with people, trying to understand people that might be different from you in any way. Um, and then writing about it. And this is a constant loop of ethnographic uh, knowledge production. Um, as you can see in this photo of uh, Napoleon Chagnon with a tribe member from the Yanomamo tribe, this was uh, very much uh, historically based on uh, white uh, men going to uh, uh, tribal areas in, in the Amazonas or Southeast Asia or Africa <clears throat> and interacting with uh, clearly marked ethnic others. Uh, this is uh, Bronislav Malinowski, uh, perhaps the, the most foundational figure in uh, ethnography, um, sitting here with the uh, Trogram Islanders um, in 1918, which has perhaps, you know, this, these are the common uh, images of early ethnography that you see uh, when you look into it. But even in this early stage, with all the problematic um, legacies, uh, there were multiple features of ethnography that were articulated quite clearly. Uh, so these are the idea of grounding things in a local context, of being immersed uh, in a cultural and social environment, uh, of participating in what people are doing there, um, listening, spending quite a long time looking at details. Um, and hopefully I cannot say that. Oh, of course, dialogue. <clears throat> so engaging in a dialogic interaction, not just looking but also being self-reflexive, so understanding who you are, what your positionality is in that place. <clears throat> but today, um, or in the past 20, 30, 40 years, ethnography has uh, moved beyond uh, ethnic others towards other kinds of otherness, um, which might be even uh, beyond the human, uh, both in terms of animal or even technological uh, others. So using uh, different kinds of technologies to join other kinds of social actors uh, that may be very distant from the original uh, <clears throat> subjects and objects of ethnographic inquiry. So today you hear a lot about multi-species, non-human, post-human uh, applications of this methodology. And in this context, <clears throat> we um, should reflect a little bit about the idea of, of graphy. So going back to writing because uh, there has been what is called the writing turn in ethnography that has emphasized the, the writing part. Uh, so ethnography is written by academics out of field notes. Uh, it usually results in a book, in dissertation, reports, essays, articles. Ethnography has been used as a kind of a synonym, synonym for monograph for a long time. And, and the goal is always to produce a kind of inscription, something that can be written and read by others. So writing is a sort of uh, what mediates knowledge from, from one group of people to another. And uh, this creates uh, another layer of problems. Mm. So most importantly, authorship, who's writing using whose knowledge uh, and expertise. 
who maintains agency, who strips agency away from others? Um, <clears throat> what is the positionality of, uh, of the ethnographer? Uh, and matters of intellectual property uh, are also quite uh, central. So if we um, move to today or the past 20, 30 years of you know, digital or the, the digital becoming quite central in societies around the world, um, we can see uh, in parallel uh, the rise of what has been called digital ethnography. Uh, this can also be found in um, the field of human computer interaction, which <clears throat> is where some of this were, was applied uh, in the earliest stages from the 80s. So human computer interaction is a discipline that studies how humans and machines, especially computing machines interact through uh, you know, the ideas from cybernetics, uh, feedback loops and interactions. And um, what scholars in, in HCI uh, realize is that you can actually use uh, methods coming from anthropology and sociology like ethnography to study interactions between these very different groups of actors uh, like humans and machines. And um, as early as 1994, so six, uh, I think you can see the top, um, there were um, scholars thinking about how to apply ethnographic methods to things like the internet. So this is a paper by uh, Mitsuko Ito. Uh, which is one of the earliest articles from uh, almost uh, 20 plus years ago, 30 almost, um, <clears throat> that notices how studying the internet uh, challenges the anthropologist because it's something new, it's a new field, and it kind of changes what uh, basic ideas of uh, ethnographic study mean, like fieldwork or uh, participant observation. What does it mean to be on fieldwork on the internet? How do you participate? Um, how, how do you maintain self-reflexivity when you're studying things that are very close to, to your home, but they're also very distant uh, because they're mediated through this new uh, information communication technologies. And uh, Ito notices that um, these um, ethnographic approaches that were just burgeoning at that time to these new domains of technology are actually um, very useful because they allow you to maintain a uh, close attention to embodiment, uh, practice, and everyday experience, which these things are usually um, ignored uh, in, when studying uh, media or communication technologies, because it's easy to focus on, on quantitative uh, large-scale studies or measuring uh, metrics and uh, things that happen uh, online. But anthropology and ethnographic methodologies allow you to focus on, on, on this embodiment of practice and everyday experience. So from the early uh, days, this was a very much um, at the core of this uh, development. <coughs> Sorry. Um, so the first way in which uh, digital ethnography allows you to uh, explore other uh, field sites is that from the beginning, um, anthropologists looking at the internet looked at things that were very different from a village or a, a tribal site or an archaeological site or any kind of social context. Uh, they were looking, for example, at emails, um, chat rooms, different kinds of online community, uh, video game spaces, um, all, all places that in the beginning would not look like a site, but the more you think about it, the more they actually are a very sometimes close knit, closely knit or expansive uh, site of social interaction. And uh, I wanted to give you some examples of uh, things that have been written um, as you know, actual digital ethnographies uh, in the past 20 plus years. Um, and these are very different. Uh, they, have, they take very different approaches to, um, to this kind of uh, research. <clears throat> one is, um, the first one is this uh, book by uh, Daniel Miller and Don Slater. <clears throat> uh, it's called The Internet and Ethnographic Approach. Oh, sorry. Uh, and they were studying uh, Trinidad and uh, how internet connections were um, starting to, to become popular there. Um, and, and how they did this was in a very much a traditional um, anthropological way. They just, they went to Trinidad and they, walked down streets into internet cafes, into people's homes, uh, looking at the infrastructure and how it was being used. <clears throat> so this is an example of uh, 
very uh, traditional approach, uh, ethnographic approach to a new medium uh, of the internet. So this is one way in which you can do it. You can go to a place and see how a technology is, is uh, arriving there or has been domesticated and used in everyday life. Uh, <clears throat> a very different approach uh, is taken, for example, by uh, works like uh, My Life as a Night Priest, Night Elf Priest by uh, Boninardi. Uh, who did uh, a very, well, again, a very traditional ethnographic um, study of uh, a massively multiplayer online game, World of Warcraft. So in this case, she didn't go anywhere uh, physically, but she uh, logged in and, and built a character and played this online game for an extended amount of time, treating the, uh, the game and in-game environment as if it was uh, just any other uh, anthropological field site. So this is a diametrically opposite approach, but it's still grounded in the very same um, tenets of ethnographic research. Um, another example, a bit more recent, is uh, Personal Portable Pedestrian, also by Mitsuko Ito. It's, a, it's an edited volume uh, she, she did with colleagues. And this is all a collection of studies <coughs> of um, uh, mobile phones. So again, it is a very situated, um, study of technology in everyday life, but it straddles different domains. It, it looks at how people uh, purchase, use, uh, feel about a uh, specific uh, device, in this case, the smartphone, in a specific context, that is Japan. <clears throat> and uh, also more recently, um, Tom Wellsdorf, uh, Coming of Age in Second Life is, um, a de declaredly uh, experimental approach to Second Life. I don't know if any of you remember it. For, it was a while ago, but it was this large scale uh, online virtual world where people could just create a character and build their house and meet with others. And Boylesdorf uh, did again a very uh, online based uh, ethnographic study of it by even building his own little island, I think, and, and uh, establishing connections and studying different topics <clears throat> in Second Life, like gender, sexuality, <clears throat> and other things. So this was a, this, this is a very, um, again, very anthropological approach to a field site that would not be normally uh, considered um, viable for ethnographic research, but, but today is. So <clears throat> uh, with these examples in mind, um, I noticed that one, uh, one element of confusion when uh, people approach digital ethnography is that uh, unfortunately, uh, social scientists love to make up buzzwords and terms for their methodologies. And so what happens is that um, you find a lot of different ways of talking about mostly the same thing. Um, and I'm putting here a, a snippet from an article I wrote recently with uh, Crystal Abedin. Uh, you can just read through this list of, uh, of different terms for pretty much the same kind of methodologies. <coughs> so for more than a decade, there, has been, uh, there have been articles discussing media anthropology, media ethnography, cyber ethnography, virtual anthropology. I'm not going to read through all of them, but uh, <coughs> these terms um, are pretty much interchangeable. With, they have minor differences that are sometimes useful, but um, they're also quite confusing for people who are approaching the methods <clears throat> from, uh, from the outside or just approaching them uh, you know, in recent years. Uh, they might feel like there is a lot to digest and before you can actually uh, adopt it. But um, <clears throat> what we have written and, and the purpose of today's talk is to kind of demystify this uh, <clears throat> collection of buzzwords a little bit. So uh, the first thing I'll do is uh, simplify. We will just go with digital ethnography. I think is, you know, quite clear. Uh, it's broad, broadly applicable. <clears throat> and I would like to define digital ethnography as uh, the use of ethnographic methods. So participant observation, long-term immersion, dialogic engagement, uh, and self-reflexive writing to conduct research uh, on, through, and about digital media as either a context a topic or a tool of study. Uh, and I think this idea of <clears throat> on, through, and about is quite um, useful to start thinking about what uh, are you actually interested in? Are you interested in looking at what happens on Facebook or Twitter or any kind of uh, social media? 
or are you interested in using digital media to uh, as a medium to look at something to look through them at some topic that interests you or are you interested in the medium themselves so are you interested in doing a study about uh, a platform or about a new infrastructure right these are three different approaches that you can use digital ethnography for so this is the definition that I will be using <clears throat> um, and when, when we discuss digital ethnography. Uh, it's from a couple of years ago. Um, and in general, I think um, it is useful to think about some principles and some topics uh, of digital ethnography. So <clears throat> the main principles are very close to ethnographic research at large. So you want to achieve a certain degree of immersion in a context. Uh, you want to do this for an extended duration of time. It's not just a one day look into something. Um, and you want to participate. So um, of course, looking at things and reading is important, but uh, participating in a social context allows you to understand more uh, in general. So uh, this often happens through dialogue. So talking to people or talking to any kind of social actor that, that you're studying, uh, trying to engage and, and have a, an interaction, even if it's a machine or a chatbot or a, an algorithm, um, you want to try to open up uh, dialogic interactions. And uh, situatedness uh, is again, the idea of finding a context and, and, and probing its boundaries and trying to, uh, to understand how it, it is limited and your experience is very much uh, contextual and situated in that context. And also from, from traditional ethnographic uh, research, you want to maintain a certain degree of self-reflexivity, thinking about your, your, your identity, even in, uh, in online spaces, um, how it's perceived and what kind of knowledge you're bringing on and what kind of knowledge you're extracting from there. Uh, and this is all, all comes to, 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 towards the idea of uh, co-constructed knowledge, which is again, the, the aim of ethnographic research. So you want to um, write something that you're co-constructing uh, with your research participants or um, whoever is you're engaging uh, in your efforts. Uh, in terms of topics, um, it, it's quite broad uh, collection of topics that you can approach through digital ethnography. And this range from uh, theories of mediation, so very high level uh, ideas about how uh, things are mediated by different technologies. You can look at protocols like uh, HTTP, 5G, all these new kinds of uh, media uh, and protocols through which people interact. You could look at devices, as we've seen, smartphones, smartwatches, computers, uh, any, any kind of new or old uh, technological device <clears throat> that uses uh, digital mediation. Um, or you could look at more abstract things like platforms. Um, so Amazon, Facebook, and any, anything that might be relevant uh, in your uh, site of interest. But you can also look at more traditional topics like identity, uh, which is you know, ever more relevant today as new identities proliferate on social media and through these new devices. Uh, and you could look at new cultural phenomena like I don't know, trolling, ghosting, or... Uh, any new practice that um, develops uh, through these new forms of mediation. Um, yeah, here I just listed some that are popular today uh, and that I have done research on, like how, how people make memes, uh, what, what happens when people live stream, how they are perceiving themselves. Um, these are all uh, quite you know, central practices in, in digital media use today. And I think this list could go on and I, I'm looking forward to hear um, what kind of research you're doing, uh, because you know more topics might be um, amenable to digital ethnographic research. So um, <clears throat> here it comes a, a bit more of a um, sharing moment. Uh, so why why would you want to do digital ethnography, um, or what kind of da data do you need? So all questions that you might have at the moment. How do you analyze the data you collect? Uh, and after you do all of this, uh, after you start engaging with digital media, collect data, an analyze it, what, what do you do with it? Uh, how do you make it uh, salient for uh, academic uh, writing and knowledge production? Uh, so I divided this into three questions uh, that I think I'm going to illustrate a little bit through my own experience, uh, hoping to uh, share 
things that you know you might relate with a bit more. Um, so the first question is what kinds of data? <clears throat> um, and, and my answer is when you do digital ethnography, you would want to have, uh, as in any kind of ethnographic study, you would want to have as many uh, and as detailed uh, bodies of qualitative data as possible. Um, so you would want to rely on, on all kinds of participant and non-participant observation documented through field notes. Um, you would want to do interviews or less formal types of interactions that you can then record, transcribe, and write self-reflexive uh, notes about them. This is, is all data. Um, <clears throat> you might want to organize focus groups or again, less formal types of uh, group uh, interaction, which again, you can record, transcribe, and, and reflect upon. Um, and you can do surveys. Surveys are not necessarily uh, quantitative. You can do a lot of uh, small scale, qualitative, um, in-depth surveys with, with people you already uh, recruited or involved in your study. And these can be more or less formal. They can range from asking a few questions to a bunch of people to putting out a, a bit of a detailed survey and invite people to contribute if they want. Uh, and you can also look at archival data. <clears throat> this is not necessarily outside of the bounds of ethnographic research. I, I have looked at a lot of uh, archival data, especially a historical one from, from websites that might have gone offline um, from previous version of apps. Um, I, I think of using archives as a sort of alternative to going to a place. Um, how, how do you look at the history of a website uh, if it's gone offline? Uh, you can find it in archives, and that's pretty much like going at a museum and looking at the past of a specific uh, field site. Uh, and in general, I would recommend to uh, to accumulate and collect uh, whatever you need as data. Uh, and and I think uh, digital ethnography requires a bit of uh, experimentation in in creating new forms of qualitative data. <clears throat> so it could be chatting with a with a robot uh, on, on a website or. Uh, if you need to test 10 digital cameras to understand <clears throat> live streamers, you know, that's, that's good qualitative data. If you need to, uh, for example, become a TikTok star to understand how uh, internet celebrity works on, on TikTok, just giving some examples, that, that is a valuable, uh, almost auto-ethnographic auto um, way of generating uh, qualitative data. So it's very much open to experimentation and I think there is a lot to be done in this, in this sense. So this is the uh, first question. And, and just to give you a sense, uh, here I have some, a collection of, of pictures and images from my field work in 2014, 15. Um, I was studying um, how the internet and digital media are used in, in Chinese everyday life. So I used a combination of hanging out with people and, and looking at, for example, how they used uh, portable, Wi-Fi routers when they traveled abroad, uh, but I also used a lot of uh, digital platforms to uh, participate in group chats and interactions and see the kind of political satire memes that were being shared. <clears throat> and then I did one-on-one um, -on -one interviews asking people, uh, for example, in this picture, to uh, use little printouts of apps and devices to map uh, to build some maps of, of which kind of services they used on different kinds of devices and understand how censorship or how their different identities uh, impacted their app use. And then I used also a bit more uh, experimental or open-ended methods like participating in or organizing and participating in local events. Um, when, for example, when I was studying internet art, uh, I joined, you know, discussions in, in uh, art exhibitions with uh, people that were not necessarily neither academics nor my research participants, but from different uh, social groups, just to be engaged in the broader cultural context of what I was trying to study. So these are just uh, just a collection of a few. Um, uh, artifacts and, and forms of, of uh, data production that I think are, are useful to keep in mind um, that you might be more or less familiar with um, that can all feed into your digital ethnographic study. Now, uh, as for question number two, I'm just going to check the time. Yeah. 
Um, question number two is uh, how, how to do it. So, okay, I want to do digital ethnography. This is the kind of data I can collect, but how do I uh, go about it? I think a key, uh, a key strategy that is also quite common in, in ethnographic research is that, yes, you, wanna, you want to spend an extensive amount of time doing the research, but that's not just to get more you know, credibility or to get more uh, like, oh yeah, I've been immersed in this context for a long time, so I know, I, know, I know more about it. I think time, an extended amount of time is also actually quite useful because it allows you to iterate, iterate your, um, your research process and uh, fine tune it because often in the beginning, you're, um, you're, you're gonna be aimless. You're gonna be looking at way too much um, and you're gonna be overwhelmed by uh, the breadth of digital media. And so taking time allows you to test different, um, different forms of research process and strategy and to finally identify, okay, that's what I wanna collect. That's how I want to do it. And at least for me, writing about my research process is always uh, an integral part of the, uh, the final output because you learn a lot even just through you know, failing and, and finding out too much and not knowing when to stop and being overwhelmed by, by data. I think it's an integral part of, of uh, digital ethnography. So time is important. Uh, allow yourself to fail. Uh, allow yourself to you know, achieve the kind of immersion you need. And iterate on your design because this allow you, allows you to zoom into what is actually relevant for your project at the moment. Uh, which details do you want to collect? There is, there is uh, infinite detail uh, as a title of a Tim Bogham's novel. Um, there is infinite detail in digital media and you cannot possibly uh, collect it qualitatively or quantitatively, uh, all of it. So you want to iterate until you zoom in into what is relevant for you. And writing again, it's ethnography, so writing is part of the analysis. Uh, writing, field notes, self-reflections, uh, any kind of a product, as you do the research, not after it, helps you develop your arguments and uh, achieve this kind of uh, focus. Uh, here I have a, a couple of examples, but <clears throat> um, in general, a good uh, heuristic for me to think about digital ethnography is this. So if you if you uh, go on the you know, on the sofa or on public transportation and you're scrolling your Facebook feed for ten minutes, that's that is your regular life, uh, at least for me, right? But if you decide to scroll your Facebook feed for thirty minutes every two hours for three months and writing a daily page of notes about what you saw, your experience, um, and your feelings about it, that uh, is the digital ethnography, right? You are you're setting yourself into a process. And you might feel that, that that's very different from the kind of uh, you know relaxed, less attentive uh, engagement that you normally have with digital media. So I think this kind of uh, uh, research design allows you to kind of focus on things. Um, and um, you know, in practical terms, this is a, this is just a photo of uh, my desk uh, again from 2014, 15, and as I was, I was traveling around China, and so this was my usual uh, hostel desk. I was just traveling with a tablet and a bunch of uh, readings and using, uh, I think, Evernote or OneNote to take notes. So just taking take, taking notes on a cloud-based service uh, every night as, as I went back to the hostel, trying to you know figure out what happened during the day, what I observed, cataloging some screenshots or photos I took. Um, and and, and uh, what would happen during the day, I mean, most of the time it was just uh, chance encounters with people, like these uh, four uh, young kids I encountered on, uh, on a boat uh, as I was crossing a river in central China, with which, you know, uh, which they chatted me up because I could speak Chinese and we started looking at each other's phones and chat groups and joining the same group to keep in touch and send some memes to each other. Uh, even this kind of happenstance, uh, you know, unpredictable interactions you have uh, kind of feed into uh, the kind of digital media you use uh, and enter your sort of this dispersed uh, field that, that is your network of contacts. So um, again, these interactions cross between, you know, everyday life uh, situations and then they 
enter your smartphone or your computer and they stay there as you know chat groups or, or online contacts and and this is pretty much how you go about doing digital ethnography in, in everyday life um, at least in my experience uh, it is one of the possibilities uh, and lastly uh, the third question that you might have is uh, which kind of challenges uh, will you encounter in doing digital ethnography that might be different from usual uh, types of qualitative research. Um, and my answer will be uh, countless challenges, but uh, luckily uh, you will not be alone. Uh, and that is something that has helped me quite a lot uh, in that when I started doing um, digital ethnographic research, it was a moment in which there was a lot of discussion about this methodology, uh, a lot of people talking about it, uh, sharing experiences, and today you have even more because a lot has been written and published and there is ongoing discussion about how new technologies like algorithmic uh, social media feeds or artificial intelligence uh, or distributed computing, how, how, how are these things again changing uh, and challenging uh, digital ethnographic fieldwork. So um, even if today you might have questions like, okay, I'm doing research on an app. So what is, where is even the field or how I can participate uh, if I'm researching how people take selfies? Uh, can I do research on digital media in another country if I cannot travel there? Uh, what about consent and ethics? Uh, should I obtain consent to ever, from everyone I talk to or should I keep my interviewees anonymous? And rather than answer these questions, um, I think the answer to this question is always very situated on the kind the project you are doing. There's no ultimate definitive uh, answer to these questions. So I would recommend to um, look into a rich body of uh, digital ethnographic research literature that is available. And I'm happy to, to share references. Uh, I have read uh, a lot of it in order to write about it. So. Uh, especially if you have specific uh, things you would like to, to know more about, I'm, I'm happy to share um, reading lists or, or suggestions. Um, and if you're interested, uh, I, I can recommend this special issue of the um, Journal of Digital Social Research that came out a couple of years ago that I edited with uh, Crystal Abedin, um, in which we collected a few papers that discuss the um, some confessional uh, accounts of doing digital ethnography with all its discomforts. So the challenges and a little bit of the uh, failures or troubling choices you have to make while doing digital ethnography. But especially in the introduction that we co-authored, I think there is a very extensive uh, collection of references. So even if you don't wanna read the whole thing, take a look at the bibliography and, and um, you, you'll find plenty of uh, reading directions that I think might be useful for various topics. Um, so this was just our contribution to, you know, methodological failures that for me are always a, a good way of approaching a new research method to know how other people have failed and how they dealt with it. It's, it's quite productive, uh, especially because <clears throat> doing research on digital media is often it's often quite messy uh, and can be very personal because we use these things uh, on a daily basis. So I think it's useful to, to share with colleagues, especially as it's a new, a rather new uh, methodological domain. Um, and also keeping in mind that doing digital media always changing and there's always something new and they're always being developed and, and uh, um, given out for people to experiment with. Uh, and in a similar way, digital ethnography is also constantly in the making and amenable to changes and, and reinventions. So that is my uh, final thoughts. And uh, in conclusion, um, I would like to uh, just summarize what I discussed. So I gave you just a rough definition of digital ethnography in the introduction. Then we went through some basics of what ethnography has been and, and is today. And then, uh, just hinted at the many different ways in which social scientists have defined digital ethnography. Uh, 
we zoomed in into this idea that digital ethnography is, after all, just a useful toolbox of methods. Uh, and then I answered three questions that perhaps you had. Uh, that is, what is digital ethnography? How to do it? And what, what, if, uh, what if I fail? Or what if it's not going too well? Um, and with this conclusion, I would like to open up uh, to the time we have for Q and A. Um, and as I said, since this is a workshop, I'm, I'm very uh, happy to, to to hear about your research projects. And if anything I said resonates with your project, or if you see any way in which digital ethnography could expand what you're doing or help you gain insight into some some area of your project, that will be a great point to discuss. So thank you. Uh, that's uh, my email if you have any questions after this. Um, and you can find me on Twitter, although it's not my most professional side. But you're welcome to, to, to get in touch. And thanks. I'm going to stop sharing. Thank you so much for such an insightful talk on digital ethnography. Uh, in case you guys have any questions, just feel free to unmute yourself and yeah. Hi. Uh, hey, can I zoom in? Hi. Hi. Uh, hi, I'm Tilan. I'm sorry. I'm uh, tuning in from my phone because, yeah, anyways. Uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. I'm just wondering, so I'm doing a PhD at the School of Geography in Leeds, and um, I'm researching how a drag community in uh, former Yugoslavia is formed online. And uh, specifically, I'm following one drag house who's, which was formed by some of the group of my friends, right? And at the beginning, I was like, oh yeah, digital ethnography, very useful buzzword. But then, uh, is there even a need for digital in ethnography, right? Because I usually then go with Sam Kingsley, who's a geographer in Exeter, and he says, well, everything is digital, right? Uh, is this, is this, specificism, digital ethnography needed, or is it just, you know, sexy to say that nowadays ethnography is digital? So just wondering, what's your thinking on that? Yeah, I think, I think definitely there is a, <clears throat> there is a, there's always been the case. Um, I mean, ethnography was sexy <laughs> at a certain point um, in general in anthropology. And then, you know, it, it's kind of the contribution that anthropology is uh, one of the main contributions in terms of method that you know it has succeeded in in uh, expanding to other social sciences, um, but for sure there have been multiple turns. You know, like the mobile turn in ethnography or multi-sided ethnography, and then um, all kinds. There's all kind of buzzwords, and there's always new ones. I think for me, um, um, I, I do actually I do different kinds of things. I mean, I've I've done more uh, traditional ethnographic work on, on topics that were very marginally digital, like heritage, uh, statues, uh, that, that was just pretty much based on going to places and talking to people and had a, a tiny bit of, of course, everything is digital. So sometimes even if you research heritage, you might look at something on Facebook or on other platforms, right? So there is always, I think, a digital component that you can look at today in, for, for a large part of topics. But um, to me, the useful <clears throat> thing about digital ethnography is that it allows you to, to argue for new configurations of things as a site of ethnographic study. So I don't know about your specific case, but um, you know, when, when a community might be visible as a community uh, only through some kinds of digital media and not through others, you know, people might say, well, how, how, you know, if you're just doing a traditional ethnographic study, you might not find that community, right? It, to find it, uh, you, you might have to go into some kind of digitally mediated context that is not a traditional social space in a city or, or in wherever, right? So to me, that just, it's just a way to, to earmark that you're focusing on digital media in some form. And as I, as I said, today's 
there's people doing digital ethnography that is 100% going somewhere and looking at how people use computers. So it's, it's, it has no practical difference from an ethnographic study of technology used in, in, in a certain place. But it's a way of saying that you are particularly attentive to the digital or the construction of this idea. So yeah, I mean, it is, it is a buzzword. That's, <laughs> we, we make this argument uh, in, our, in our paper, um, but sometimes buzzwords are useful to tell people what you're doing, I think. Sure. Thanks. I think there's a question from Naresh Kakkar who wants, wants to know how we can use it uh, in social media apart from, uh, in social life apart from digital media. Oh yeah, I haven't, I haven't looked at the chat at all. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, let me see. How can you use in social life apart from digital media? I mean, to me, it's, um, as I was saying, it's the digital is such a huge term today that it could be, it can be applied to anything. I mean, there are like, for example, in, in Chinese cities, there are digital development districts, you know, that have really nothing to do with digital media, like social media, they're just a place where a lot of digital computing companies are encouraged to develop. But when, when you go there and you try to look at how the district has been developed and how this idea of the digital plays in it or processes like digitization of the classroom <clears throat> or of the workplace, uh, digital the digital in digital ethnography is not just social media. Uh, Maybe I, most of the examples I gave are social media because that's what I study in a large part, but there is so much um, about the digital that is not social media. Uh, so it could be a lot of different kinds of devices, uh, infrastructures, protocols, um, different ways in which digital media operate in everyday life, e-commerce, gig economy, apps like Uber or delivery services, delivery work, uh, there, there is a lot. So I think, as I said, it is a broad methodological term uh, <clears throat> that you can use to study pretty much any aspect of social life that is mediated by something digital. Um, so yeah, I don't know how this might apply to, to your specific context, but there, I think there's always ways in which it actually applies. <clears throat> and I see, uh, Sabine, you had a question about, um, oh no, not you. Brett had that question about digital humanities. <clears throat> um, and yeah, I mean, I, I agree. So digital humanities is <clears throat> also a broad field and it's um, kind of overlapping. Uh, the department in which I am now has a quite strong digital humanities uh, cluster. Uh, I think digital humanities focuses much more on the archival part, archives, uh, big data sets. Uh, it's kind of an extension of humanities um, so how do you study new corpora of literature, texts, uh, creative production that is now being digitized? So I think as, as a digital ethnographer, sometimes you, you can use some methods from digital humanities if you're looking at a lot of texts, uh, digital texts. But as I said, digital ethnography does not really limit itself to reading uh, or analyzing textual sources. Uh, you would want to participate, engage, have dialogues, you know, talk to people, because that's the strength of it. But there are definitely overlaps on that. Yes, and I think Ruben has <coughs> his hand up. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. Unfortunately, my questions are also about social media. <laughs> although, that's, that's great, that's uh, good. <laughs> so, um, you know, like I, um, uh, I mean, uh, there, there is a, there, there is a joke that um, if you if you um, assess the Instagram profiles in the world, the outcome will be that the half of the world are billionaires. You know, and saying such, I it's um, I want to ask about how you distinguish the representation and let's say the real whatever the real life yeah 
Uh, and and I, I mean, I understand that uh, people making uh, making research on digital humanities are well trained and are very well known about those dangers. But there is, I guess, there is not one type of danger. Like uh, just remembered, I just uh, remembered that uh, exactly in, in the context of China, this uh, Papi Chuan, uh, who is uh, who who has like. The most followers in Sina Weibo, she advocates the daily life. So it's not about fancy clothes and uh, and and travel to Maldives, but but about like daily lives, relationship with the man who cleans the apartment and who you know who washes the dishes and all these questions. But in the end, it's also about the representation of normality. The representation of daily life, and in the end, it also has very, very—I mean, not very, but somehow also political agenda of trying to, to somehow to make to put socialism or to, to yeah, like to. Um, so first, one, one first question: like, how do you distinguish this? And also, like, it, 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 it like I would embed it into the general question online and offline uh, digitalization, where are the differences and which are the obstacles? Sorry, I guess my question was very broad, but just it's a very good example to see how the real life different is different, but also that exactly in, 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 in social media, also this very difficult premises also exist. And how do you have, a, uh, which approach do you have on it? Yeah, thanks. <clears throat> Actually, uh, this is a quite um, interesting thing because the this um, I start from the from the end. So this distinction of online offline is one of the most discussed topics in the digital ethnography literature, especially the, in the two thousand like early years. Uh, a lot of discussion is about you know what is online, what is the difference? Is there really a difference? And I think uh, you know a decade or more into these debates today is pretty widely accepted that um, it's more of a discursive difference today that the people talk about being offline or online but when you look at the practices um, especially in places where there's a high degree of the digitization and digital media use it's not really relevant because the social contexts are so mixed that you're not never really online or offline. You you use things as part of your everyday life, um, and some part of your life is always mediated by this new media. So, so yeah, if you're interested in this, there's a lot of discussion, and I think it's one of the key um, uh, arguments of digital ethnography that uh, it's not really a useful uh, the distinction anymore. It's more useful to see how people perceive it. Um, <clears throat> and going to the other part of your question. I'm going to give you an example from uh, a colleague of mine that we, we co-authored uh, some stuff on uh, online celebrity in China. Uh, I'm mostly drawing on his work, um, Dino Zhang from uh, UIC <coughs> in, uh, in Zhuhai. He, uh, he, he, do, he did a lot of uh, research on live streamers and uh, online celebrities in China. And I think the key difference is that uh, a lot of research and media attention goes to these, you know, massive celebrities like the one you mentioned, like Papi Cheng, who have, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of followers, and they define, you know, which new trends and things happen. But if you adopt a digital ethnographic uh, approach to this topic, for example, to online celebrity, then you would not necessarily look at the top celebrity. You might be interested in their followers, or you might be interested in other people, maybe minor celebrities on that platform, or maybe um, you might be interested in how regular users discuss her, her videos or her live streams, right? And I think that's the key distinction between more media studies approaches that look at the, the phenomenon or look at the, uh, the, the ecosystems, you know, digital ecosystems of content and digital ethnography. Digital ethnography would never be able to say, oh, I'm doing a digital ethnography of Instagram, or I'm doing a digital ethnography of 
online celebrities, because there's so many, it's impossible to even follow one accurately, right? So what happens is that you zoom in, zoom in, zoom in until you find what actually interests you and you might end up studying maybe one specific community of fans of one specific celebrity. And then, you know, following this community for an extended period of time, or maybe following some minor celebrities that are struggling to become famous and you interview them and you talk to them about their, their life, their thoughts on the platform. This is, I think this is the key difference that digital ethnography allows you to go a bit more into detail uh, through this like, extensive engagement on smaller case studies or, or uh, examples. So from this, from this very like from this more narrow perspective, you can then look at the broader thing that you mentioned, like, oh, are these live streamers promoting a certain, you know, uh, more socialist way of life that is aligned with the Chinese state? But then, then you're looking at it from below, right? You're looking at this big question from what you what you uh, learned from people who are doing these things, from actual live streamers. And then this might in turn allow you to be more critical or to unsettle certain presuppositions. Not always, but you know, ideally, I think that's the, the movement you wanna, you wanna kind of get in, get in the field, uh, even if it's just a digital uh, thing of opening up an app and looking at a live stream, right? That's the, just a the starting point. Uh, I don't know if this answered your question, but yeah. Sure, thank you very much. I also have a question. So uh, my question is, so in case if someone is analyzing a case from maybe 1950s or 1940s, and obviously those people who are adult at that time are maybe dead now, or maybe they are too old to speak, or maybe that the region is fragile, that you cannot really go there and talk to people. And also talking to people on social media or online is a bit risky. Do you think that analyzing maybe newspaper articles and documentaries and archive material adds to digital ethnography because you already have sort of answered it. You were telling someone, I think Nira, you were telling him that you have to engage with people. So what is your take on that? Yeah, I mean, as I said, I think archival research is, is an integral part of it. I always do some degree of archival research in, in my projects. If it's, you know, it could be looking at historical news or historical documents, government stuff, like it's always useful to look at history. Um, so there's a couple of ways I've done this. Uh, one is, uh, I can give you an example from an article I wrote about Hong Kong. Um, so I wrote this article about historical images of Hong Kong. So you've probably seen on Facebook or Twitter or social media that it's very common to see these historical photos of Hong Kong saying, oh, it was so beautiful. It's, you know, it under colonialism and mixture of cultures and everything. It's kind of a, a nostalgia for Hong Kong. And I was curious to see where did this come from, right? Where do these pictures come from? Who is sharing them? So with a colleague, we found, we actually found a couple of uh, huge Facebook groups where people were sharing these historical materials. And then we, you know, we, we became part of these groups. Uh, we got, you know, we managed to get in them and we, we talked to a lot of group members. And we, we realized that these people were like the people you mentioned, right? People, they were very old <laughs> most of the time. There were people who were born there in the 50s or 40s and they were, they were using Facebook to kind of reminisce about their youth, posting photos from their family archives. Um, so in a way, to me, this is one kind of approach you can have that is you know, a digital ethnographic approach to archival materials. So yes, you're, you're looking at them, but you're also finding maybe places in which people are sharing them or people are preserving them. So how, how are people preserving stuff, right? How, uh, how are they making archives? How are they making sense of them? Uh, is there contestation? So I think that could be could be a way, right? Seeing if, uh, for example, if the news from the era you're looking at are are they archived in some online repository? Who's managing it, right? Could you could you get in touch with the people there and or who's you know who's in charge of collecting them? That that's a possibility. You mentioned that interacting with people from the area might be risky. That's that's always a, <clears throat> a concern, right? Um, so again, there's no real answer to that in the sense that 
even even doing research about China is always has a degree of risk for for people who are participating in your research. So that ultimately is up to you, you know, making uh, ethically informed evaluations of, yeah. of risk. But I think that might be um, a way. But regardless, I think looking at historical material, even if you don't engage with anyone, is always a, at least a good grounding for any kind of qualitative project. So, yeah. Thank you. Uh, Narmin has, I don't know if it's... Um, yes, I have a question, if you don't mind. And also, can you hear me? I just moved the yes, different yes. rooms to... Okay, good. Uh, uh, Gabriel, thank you so much. It is very much interesting and look at this general overview of this digital ethnography. And you touch, touch upon and the guys asking about the question, the challenges and limitations about doing the uh, research on digital ethnography. But my question is the will be very much uh, like positionality during your research how you reflect and you keep your position when you are doing, let's say, this ethnographic, like let's say archival work, like let's say uh, narrating this way of stories, public memory or colonized, politicized documentation or historical documentation, how you keep uh, your positionality, this is first question. And secondly, is really, is digital method can affect it in a way can affect in a way like have an impact to change it, this digital method, this traditional ethnography or, or the data or the raw data, let's say, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think so. And I, I, I'm gonna actually like, also follow up on the on the previous question because something else came to my mind which is, is exactly what you're asking um i think one interesting strategy could be if you're doing research on archival materials historical data things that might be you know just in the archive nobody's talking about them or or, or if there is no one available to discuss them with then you know i think one good strategy is to make them visible and make them you know see if they elicit discussion so i think historical data is quite good at that because when you put it out and you curate it and you present it you will have people from that context regional historical context who, who will come up and say what they think you know have probably very contentious opinions around them because historical history is always contested. So I think that might be actually a good way of experimenting with data, uh, trying to make a, I don't know, a curated collection or a public repository or saying, well, you know, a rediscovered history of this topic, right? Putting the data out there and see, for example, if a lot of people join the, you know, your Facebook page or blog or whatever it is, or Twitter hashtag and start uh, commenting or creating, you know, discussions, because at that point, then you're creating uh, the, the social context, right? If, if there is no social context, I think it's always uh, relevant to create one, right? It, it, it doesn't need to be a naturalistic uh, research in, in, in something that already exists and you go there and you see exactly what's happening. You can, you can create the context. That would be similar to, you know, organizing a a forum or a, so, uh, like a focus group for discussion, right? Um, so you're making the archival material visible and hoping, just checking if this creates uh, discussion, contention, if it becomes, you know, politicized by some nationalist group or whatever. Like, I don't know the context, but I think that's always a possibility. So um, that that could create, in a way, the, the kind of, uh, field site that then you can you can say well we're, we are doing research on this so let's you know let's discuss let's interview people who are who are being uh, you know who are trolling us or who are aggressive or whatever like it could be a it could be a way of um, opening things up I, I don't know if it's applicable but i think it might be worth thinking about the possibility yeah yeah but uh i had another question but yeah. i think manisa she got the question but it is out of curiosity yeah. during the field work is there any interesting like some interesting like the experience you had or you know oh. something funny 
enjoyable you can share with us <laughs> in China? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I had a lot of fun, and then it's you know, of course, I think for me personally, it's always better uh, when I'm able to do both things at the same time. So right. traveling there, being there, even just you know, even on and off, but being able to to spend some time there. Uh, and at the same time, looking at, in my case, social media, you know, but, um, but even now that travel is impossible for, you know, two more years, um, I, I'm still able to do quite a lot. And um, I had I had a lot of fun, you know, years ago, just, you know, hanging out with friends, maybe people I only met online, and finally, you know, we we're able to meet each other and talk about, you know, our favorite funny videos or, or memes. Um, and, you um, uh, some of my articles discuss this, like I had one article that was just basically based on one research participant. Uh, and it's a whole discussion about how he used to make memes that are funny uh, with specific, you know, Chinese popular culture topics. Um, so for me, that's, that's really fun because it's what I'm interested in, but it's also a way of uh, just, you know, Doing doing things that you would be interested in anyway, but you know, in a more focused uh, engaging, yeah, yeah. And and now recently that uh, it's all completely online and distanced, I uh, still had a lot of uh, interesting experiences, mostly uh, through interviews. So interviewing some artists who work with uh, artificial intelligence about their work. Uh, so even if you're distanced, you can still build you know relationships and feel somewhat close to people. And also, uh, you know, depending on the circumstances, using what you can find at hand, if people are traveling, you know, or if you can invite people or do some kind of exchanges, you can still maintain some form of relationships. Um, and also, I, I've, did, I've done some more, uh, you know, traditional projects, the one I mentioned about uh, heritage and statues. That was also quite fun because you, you end up discovering... Um, this was in Taiwan. It was about some nationalist um, heritage that is still around in the cities. Uh, and it began as just, you know, observing the statues and talking to some politicians or local officials. But then it, it started being more and more about Facebook groups and weird memes, uh, which also became quite interesting because you don't expect, expect it, but then, you know, it becomes more digital just naturally. And then you find out a lot of existing humor and criticism around these historical legacies. Um, so for me, it's always like a discovery. And I think in a way, digital ethnography allows you to be open to some things that you would not normally see when you use other methods. That could be ethnography or archeological or digital humanities. It's kind of a way to open up your research into new, new fields. Yeah. Thank you so much, fascinating. Oh, thank Thanks you. so much. Was there other other questions then? No, in the chat. No. Yeah, I think Monish Monish has a question. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Hi everyone. Um, I think I really found the session and then the interaction quite engaging and interesting. Um, I, and I I really believe that this is one area that really needs more of such engagement till it's you know, well-established and well-understood research approach, um, because we are still clueless about a lot of uh, you know, uh, parameters when it comes to digital ethnography. Uh, one area that I would uh, you know, want you, Gabriel, to speak about, or maybe you know, help out, or maybe how to approach it is, is the sample size. You know, how much of data is good enough data here? Uh, you know, over the last few years, I've been working with social media, particularly during the COVID uh, times, and uh, I've had, a, a, you know, a, an interdisciplinary team with me working, you know, bringing in approaches from AI. So then that kind of drives it into the quantitative framework a lot more. Um, but if you go back to the roots of ethnography, then it has to have that, you know, human, humanistic intervention and the um, qualitative nature to it. So maybe share something on that. And then um, secondly, uh, 
I really found the invite particularly, you know, really nice in terms of being able to join the group. I would be really, really happy to do so and would want you to maybe talk about the areas with regards to media, with regards to social media in particular that you guys are, you know, working on your future project so that, you know, we can collab and think of some work together. Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. I'm glad if, if it was interesting. Um, I, I don't know anything about this group, so I cannot answer the last question. <laughs> I will leave it to them. But the in terms of uh, your question on sample size, um, I, I agree with you. And I mean, I, I, I've also been involved in more quantitative projects, um, but I can see the there is a very strong distance between the two approaches in the sense that um, for me, in my experience, um, data is, of course, you know, the, you never have enough. Uh, you always feel like you don't have enough. And I think that's a feature of qualitative research that you always feel like you could do one more interview, 10 more people, uh, look at five more case studies. Um, but ultimately, um, I, what I found is that I always have way too much. Like when, I, when I sit down and go to write, the article or the chapter, uh, I always have way too much data. So I think that's kind of a tension between, yes, you, you always feel like you need more, but actually you always have a lot because qualitative data is deep, uh, just in terms of depth of how much detail you, you write in your notes and things you accumulate, um, which I think is what you're, you're, uh, you're mentioning that you find, you know, qualitative, quantitative data is a bit more shallow in terms of, of depth. Um, so for me, uh, I think if you engage in the kind of research I described in which you, you know, you spend time and you collect data and you write notes, I, I never worry too much about sample size because I find that when I go to write, I have a lot and I have to cut a lot in just in order to make an argument in, in the article I'm writing. So, of course, I, I, I don't do, you know, these massive studies of interviewing uh, 300 people. Uh, it never happens just because I don't have time and funding to do it. And it's always uh, more manageable sizes. I think in my, in my, even for my PhD with, you know, six months of fieldwork in China and six more months uh, online, eventually I interviewed maybe 20, 25 people. Uh, and that was enough because when you combine it with uh, your observations and, and your readings of archival material and, uh, the online part, there is so much uh, data that you can not put even like 5% of the interview material in the thing you're writing. So for me, it's, it's um, and it's always a process also. So I, I never really end a research project. Usually I start it, I write something about it and I keep, you know, collecting more over time. And then maybe I write a second paper about it and it keeps, you know, it keeps growing and you keep, figuring out which kind of detail you need next and which person you should talk to. And it's, uh, that's why, I mean, it's an iterative process that kind of uh, builds over time. So you, you will find, depending on the issue, you know, which, uh, what number of people you, you ideally want to talk to. But I think, as I said, I wrote a paper just based on my interactions with one person <laughs> that were very, you know, extensive and, and um, dialogically deep that I thought were enough to sustain a, a, an argument about you know, what one person was doing with, uh, with memes and, and, uh, and um, apps. So I think the scope is from, from that, from one person to, to 100, to three, whatever. Uh, yeah, I think it's more, you know, it's more about the, the depth and uh, what you're saying uh, with the data. Yeah. I don't know if, if uh, you want to, someone else wants to say more about the, research group part. No, thank you. I, it kind of reaffirms what I kind of, you know, was thinking about because the essence of ethnography has to be there. So rightly, and you, the example that you gave just now about, you know, single person being injured, that was absolutely interesting. And I would really want you to share, um, you know, the link to paper or, as well. Oh yeah, I, I can share. And I think that's actually, I mean, I, it's, it's quite common in, in anthropology, you know, sometimes you read papers that are just like, uh, oh yeah, I, I was, you know, I, I lived in this place for a long time and I had a discussion with this person over months and here's an article about it. Uh, that is often very, you know, very informative because you, uh, 
just you can see it how everything that whole context is summarized into these very personal interactions so it's yeah it's all possible i, I will share maybe i can i can paste it here um, i think regarding part two we would love to collaborate in whatever ways we can and thank you so much for like asking for being collaborative or Thank and you. I think so Arvind can add. Yeah. Thank you for like uh, giving me access to the workshop. Actually, Sabine, thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining. And I think Narmin can add more to the collaboration part because she's the founder of the network. So yeah, I would love if she can add more to that. Yeah. Um, yeah, uh, Monisa, thank you so much for your interest and in joining our um, workshop. So we are very much focusing on the caucuses and beyond. The, the, our committee members, uh, so our audience mainly coming from the, the, the doing the research on the field of uh, archaeology, ethnography, anthropology uh, in the caucuses. But we are, we are kind of starting to uh, expand our um, uh, audience and reach out to different regions and different fields as well. Uh, so please uh, feel free to get in touch. And uh, if you want to present your research, your paper, uh, lecture, please feel free. Uh, we can give the platform and uh, yeah, we can create this platform for you. Uh, so yeah, um, so everyone is welcome. Please follow us in our social media and it will be available on our YouTube channel, the workshop. So yeah, great. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's a wrap for today's workshop. I hope so. Uh, also, uh, I would just like to express my gratitude to our workshop facilitator for delivering such an interactive workshop session on digital ethnography and also I'm highly thankful to all the participants who take out their precious time to join this session and also just keep an eye on the future workshops that we are going to organize on this platform yeah thank you so much yeah thank you for inviting me thank you very much for okay. engaging thanks bye -bye. So much. bye bye everyone thank bye -bye. you and good luck thank you see you in the future events yes Great.